If we're following Christ, Christ comes first. If we're following Christ, Christ comes first. Happy New Year, everyone. I pray that 2021 may be a much better year than 2020. I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. But most of all, I pray that all may go well with your soul. May we all follow Jesus more faithfully than ever before. May we be more dedicated to Christ the King than ever before. In 2021, may we all surrender to the Savior more than ever before. The old hymn says, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. If I'm honest, in the past, I probably should have altered those lyrics. Not I surrender all, but I surrender some. I may have surrendered my Sundays. Okay, maybe some Sundays. Okay, maybe some Sunday mornings. Because, you know, aren't Sunday afternoons for socializing and shopping and small screens and sports? But following Christ is not a game. It entails giving everything and being willing to give up everything to God. Speaking of giving, thanks be to God we just had another holiday or holy day season. And as we've said, the greatest of all Christmas presents is the presence of Christ. But as a child, as has been said, I was more concerned with the presence under the tree than the one who hung on the tree. For me, instead of holidays being about giving, holidays were about receiving. I couldn't wait for the holiday to find out what I got. But then I got a little older and discovered that now I was also expected to do some giving. And when I was younger, I had it all worked out. On Mother's Day, I would ask my dad to help me buy something for my mom. On Father's Day, I would ask my mom to help me to buy something for my dad. Little did they know that they were basically buying presents for each other. But I'm sure it warmed their hearts to get a gift from their son. Similarly, C.S. Lewis writes of a child who asked his father for a few coins to buy his father a present. The father does so. But as Lewis points out, the father is really no richer for the transaction. He's just getting back what he's already given. Nonetheless, it warms the father's heart to get a gift from his child. My brothers and sisters, it's crucial to understand that everything we have is a gift from God. Our time is a gift from God. Our talent is a gift from God. Our treasure is a gift from God. Our very lives are a gift from God. Every breath we take is because of God's grace, God's unmerited favor. And we are to respond to God's grace with faith, with faithfulness. We have to faithfully give back what God has already given. And it warms our Heavenly Father's heart to get gifts from his children. Thanks be to God, all who are faithful to Christ have the right to become children of God. And if we are truly king's kids, we must respond to Christ's royalty with Christian loyalty. If we claim that Christ is king, we are not the kings or queens of our own lives. If we claim Jesus is Lord, we are not the lords of our own lives. We are not to serve at the pleasure of the self. We are to serve at the pleasure of the Savior. We are to give everything to the one who gave us everything. This is the radical call of Christian discipleship. As one author puts it, following Jesus means Jesus comes first. As our Lord, he should be first and foremost in our lives. As our leader, we should follow him and his commands. We must mimic the master. We must copy the Christ. In context, Jesus speaks about the cost of Christian discipleship right after Peter's great confession. Christ asks his disciples in Mark 8, 29, he asks, who do you say I am? This is the central question of the gospel of Mark. 
and the central question of life. Peter replies, you are the Messiah. Now this confession is a turning point that splits the Gospel of Mark in half. In the first half, Jesus is traveling around and outside of Israel. In the second half, he has right to the heart of Israel, right to Jerusalem, right to the cross. At this pivotal point, as we read in Mark 8.31, it says Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. And by the time we get to chapter 8 in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has already rebuked the stormy seas, saying, Peace be still. He's already walked on water. He's already driven out demons. He's healed the sick. He's claimed to forgive sin. He's claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He's raised the dead. He's even fed over 4,000 people with a Lunchable, with some fish and chips. Fish and chips, five loaves and two small fishes. So I guess you can get some biblical Lunchables. I don't know if you can find that on Amazon, but uh, nowadays you can find almost anything on Amazon. So I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but Jesus, he's done a lot of great things already in, in the Gospel of Mark. So Peter is likely thinking, this guy has power. This guy has authority. This guy is the one we've been waiting for, the anointed one. As we've said before, and as you may recall, Christ or Christos is the Greek word that translates the Hebrew term Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. Back in the day, anointing entailed being set apart and empowered to achieve God's purpose. In the Old Testament, the prophesied Messiah is depicted as a great king in the line of King David, who would reign and establish God's reign on earth forever. Thus, in the first century, many Jews were expecting a Messiah who would set them free from their earthly oppressors. They were looking for an overpowering hero who, with God's power, would drive the hated Romans out of Israel, establishing a new, everlasting kingdom. Ancient Jewish writings expressed the hope of such a conquering Messiah very graphically. One writing said that the Messiah would purge Jerusalem from Gentiles, smash the arrogance of sinners like a potter's jar, and shatter their substance with an iron rod. Another writing said that the Messiah would redden the mountains with the blood of his enemies. You see, they were looking for a warrior who would shed the blood of their enemies, not a lamb who would shed his blood for his enemies. They were looking for one who would slay sinners, not one who would be slayed for sinners. Furthermore, although Son of Man can simply mean person, as it often does in the Old Testament, Jesus is likely using the term as a divine title. As we've said before, in Daniel 7, the prophet writes, in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel seven thirteen to 14. And later in Mark 14, the high priest asked Jesus point blank, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? See that in Mark 14, 61b. Jesus replies, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. You see, Jesus used the same language as Daniel and gives himself the divine title, Son of Man. This is why he's condemned for blasphemy. As you read in Mark 14, 63 to 64, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Mark 14, 63 to 64. I say all that to say, 
since Jesus affirms that he is the Messiah and that he is the Son of Man, who is supposed to have an everlasting kingdom, one can understand why Peter is a little confused. Peter likely even thinks he's doing the right thing by correcting Jesus. In verse 32, we read that Jesus spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside to rebuke him. Now, could you imagine trying to rebuke the Savior of the world? But how many of us have ever tried to tell God what he ought to do, like we know better? Do we sometimes have a flawed understanding of who Jesus is? Do we sometimes misunderstand the will of God? Do we serve the God who made us in his image or a false God we have made in our own imagination? Maybe we shouldn't be too hard on Peter. Given the common messianic thinking of his day, he might have had dreams of triumphant victories, cheering crowds, and royal robes. But Peter is mistaken. Likewise, we might think that following Christ means we'll be delivered from all our earthly problems, that we'll triumph in all of our earthly endeavors, that we'll attain all of our earthly desires. But we also would be mistaken. Peter has the right answer, but the wrong understanding. In contrast to conquering, Jesus, the Messiah, starts talking about suffering. Now, back in the day, no one thought Israel's promised Messiah would suffer. Now, we know that Isaiah 53 says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. It seems clear to us that this refers to Jesus, the Messiah. However, nowhere in ancient Jewish writings do we find the Messiah being associated with the suffering servant of Isaiah. So for Peter and many other Jews during that time, a suffering Messiah will be a contradiction in terms. It will be an oxymoron, like a married bachelor, a square circle, a defeated victor. Something like jumbo shrimp, an oxymoron, I'm a jumbo shrimp. This is what a suffering Messiah would sound like. A suffering Messiah doesn't make sense. So Jesus has to correct Peter and the others concerning the true mission of the Messiah. As we know, many times half-truths are more dangerous than blatant falsehoods because half-truths are more easily believed. The most convincing lies consist of a little bit of truth. And as has been said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Charles Spurgeon. So Peter is almost right. Jesus is the messianic king. He is the divine son of man, but he is also the suffering servant. Christ is the one whom they expect, but he does not come how they expect. They wanted a conqueror, but they got a carpenter. Peter knows who Jesus is, but not why Jesus has come. For Peter, the death of the Messiah is unthinkable. For Jesus, it is inevitable. Now, because Peter opposes Christ's mission to the cross, in that moment, he becomes Christ's opponent or adversary. In Hebrew, adversary is the meaning of the word Satan or Satan. Anyone who opposes the will of God becomes an adversary of God. They are doing the work of Satan, the ultimate adversary. So after Peter rebukes Jesus, Jesus rebukes Peter. In Mark 8.33, he says, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Mark 8.33. Now, I've never served in the military or in law enforcement, so you all correct me if I'm wrong. But people of lower rank usually don't give orders to their commanding officers, right? And also, I'm no parent, but I'm sure parents can remember a time when their child got out of line. I know my parents can. And when children get out of line, a good parent is likely going to proceed with a, how should I put this, a reorientation of the child's estimation of the situation. 
In other words, they might knock some sense into them. I know my parents do. It's funny because I appreciate the spankings now. As the hymn goes, we'll understand it better by and by. You see, I now realize that they weren't punishing me just to punish me. They punished me to correct me. And if my parents didn't correct me, I might have gotten into all kinds of trouble. When we see a child acting up in public, we often think to ourselves, that child needs to be disciplined. And Jesus is about to discipline his disciple. Peter is out of line. And Jesus likely does not rebuke him just to rebuke him. This is not rejection, this is correction. He has to change Peter's perspective. He tells Peter to get behind him, to fall back in line, following his orders. He's putting Peter in his place, the rightful place of anyone who claims to follow Jesus, behind Christ. For if we are following Christ, Christ comes first. So Mark 8, 34 to 38 to truly follow Jesus, you have to do more than call him by the right title. In Mark, even demons call Jesus the Son of God. As we see in Mark 3.11, Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. As Jesus says in Matthew 7.21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. And in Luke six forty six, he asks, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, it doesn't matter how he's labeled if you're not loyal. It doesn't matter what you call him if you're not really all in. And as has been said, a wrong view of messiahship leads to a wrong view of discipleship. In other words, if one misunderstands the message and mission of Christ, one will misunderstand how to faithfully follow Christ. So now, Jesus is going to explain the true meaning of following him, describing the conditions of Christian discipleship. Then, he will elaborate on the consequences of of true or false discipleship. So Mark 8.34 Mark 8.34 And having summoned the crowd along with his disciples he said to them If anyone desires to follow behind me they must deny themselves carry their cross and follow me. Continuing. Now he has just rebuked Peter in front of the disciples but now he summons the entire crowd, not just the disciples. Everybody's about to get a lesson in Discipleship 101. After telling Peter to get behind him, he now explains that anyone who wants to follow behind him, it's the same word in the Greek, they must deny themselves, carry their cross, and follow him. But what does it mean to deny oneself? Interestingly, this is the same word used when Peter denies Christ three times. Peter renounces Christ. Christ wants us to renounce ourselves. Now, denying oneself is not merely giving up our guilty pleasures, like giving up chocolate or sugar for Lent. It's not necessarily living as a monk. It's not self-starvation. It's not self-hatred. The phrase literally means to say no to oneself. More metaphorically, it means to refuse to think about what one just wants for oneself. It means declining to follow any natural inclination that is contrary to Christ. It entails reorienting our priorities, putting God's will before self-will. As one scholar writes, it is to renounce your claim to yourself, desires, ambitions, personal goals, and to submit to Christ as his servant. We must say, not my will, but thy will be done. Our culture is so engrossed with self-fulfillment and self-interest and self-determination. We Americans love autonomy, don't we? We want to do whatever we want, whenever we want, 
and however we want to do it. We love independence. And don't we hate when someone tries to tell us how we ought to live our lives? Society tells us, just do you. Scripture says, act just and do right. People say, trust yourself no matter what anyone else thinks. Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Society says, follow your dreams. The scripture says, follow your deliverer. Society says, follow your heart. The Savior says, follow me with all your heart. To Christ, we have to surrender our self-determination, our self-sufficiency, and our selfish ambition. If we bow to the author of all life, he must have complete authority of our lives. Many of us are self-centered. Our lives revolve around us. Christ calls us to shift our life's center of gravity from the self to the Savior. Many times we, we think like this, as if the world revolves around us. But instead of the world revolving around us, we should say, my world revolves around the sun. The S-O-N, sun. Jesus has to be at the center, as the song says. So while the world encourages us to be selfish, Christ wants us to be self less and how much does Jesus want us to deny ourselves to the point of taking up our own cross and you know the world makes a mockery of the cross of Christ for years entertainers have worn shiny crosses of Christ while saying and doing some of the most unchristian things for many who wear expensive crosses it really means look at how much money I make not Look at the Savior I serve. For many, wearing a cross is just a fashion statement, not a statement of faith. It's a fashion statement, not a faith statement. Could you imagine walking around with a guillotine around your neck? How about a golden electric chair? How about a silver noose? Why don't we wear these other symbols of public execution as jewelry? You see, in the Roman Empire, crucifixion was the most humiliating and excruciating form of public execution. It's actually where we get the term excruciating from. Crux in Latin is cross. Romans would decapitate people, burn others alive, and even throw others into the Colosseum to be eaten by wild animals. But only rebels and slaves the lowest of the low in the eyes of Rome. They were the ones who were crucified. Moreover, the cross was a symbol of the oppression of the hated Romans, the most visible image of their terror. It served as a grave warning to any who would dare oppose the mighty Roman Empire. Now, to carry one's cross refers to how those condemned to die would carry the horizontal beam of the cross, that is, the crossbar, to the place where they would be crucified. Now, in this background, I use a picture of a person carrying a full cross for dramatic effect, but realistically, the condemned person would just carry the cross beam, which in Latin was the patibulum, if I'm saying that correctly, just the crossbar. And then the vertical spike would stay in the ground, but they would carry their own crossbar to that vertical spike, and whatever their charge was would be placed in a sign over their heads. And these crossbars could have weighed like 75 to 125 pounds. So this is not not a very light object. Once again, it's called a patibulum. So think about what it means to carry one's cross. To carry one's cross. So as the person walked to the site of their death, they were often surrounded by a mob that would hurl insults at them. Then they'd be nailed to the crossbar, hoisted up on the vertical beam, and exposed until they died, 
usually of asphyxiation. You see, the Romans, they wanted to maximize shameful publicity and pain. So this is a striking metaphor. Carrying a cross meant walking while being weighed down by the instrument of one's own death. Carrying a cross meant being mocked by the masses who were waiting to watch you die. Carrying a cross meant marching to public execution. So Jesus is telling anyone who wants to follow him that they must deny their own self-interest, even to the point of death, the most shameful death of their time. And if Christ died for the gospel, it only makes sense that following his lead can also lead to dying for the gospel. According to church tradition, except for John, all of Christ's disciples died for the faith. And many Christians around the world are still dying for the faith, even today. Data from the Pew Research Center and studies by the University of Notre Dame suggest that Christians are persecuted in more countries than people of any other religion. In fact, across the globe, more of our brothers and sisters are dying for the faith now than at any other time in the last 2,000 years. In certain Middle Eastern countries, when someone asks to join an underground church, they ask two questions. Are you willing to be persecuted for Christ? And two, are you willing to die for him? Not to mention, according to a 2020 report in Nigeria, since June 2015, 12,000 Christians have been killed by Islamist attacks. This report by the Nigerian human rights organization named the International Society for Civil Liberties and the Rule of Law, Interest Society, according to that report, in the first five months of 2020 in Nigeria, 600 Christians were killed. In the first five months of 2020. Nigerian Christians have had their farms and their bodies set on fire. Priests and seminarians have been kidnapped for ransom. And many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have been beheaded. So dying for the faith is a reality for many Christians around the world, even today. Thanks be to God, in America, we typically do not have to worry about such persecution. And Christ is not saying that all of his followers are literally going to die for the faith. For instance, in the parallel passage in Luke 9.23, it says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So this is likely not necessarily a literal death. But whether metaphorically or literally, carrying one's cross means death and shame in sacrificial service to Christ. As I say, Christ wants us to be ride or die. Now, the final follow me in this verse is in a present continuous tense. Thus, true discipleship is not merely about coming to the altar one day and saying, I want to give my life to the Lord. It is an ongoing, constant commitment to actually give one's life to the Lord. As been said, following means accompanying someone who takes the lead. Following Christ means Christ comes first. Jesus takes the lead. Ever play the game, follow the leader? Well, in the game of life, we have to follow Christ, our leader. In obedience, we have to walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, and think like Jesus. We must follow the leader. If we're following Christ, Christ comes first. We must follow the leader. We must follow Christ. And have you ever played the game Simon Says? Well, in the game of life, we should only do things that the Savior says. We should only do things that the Savior says. Doing so may allow us to avoid pitfalls in life. Now, as I've said, I'm a suburban boy, born and raised. Growing up, I didn't know nothing about subways, one-way streets, and parallel parking. About the first two years of our marriage, my wife and I lived in Philadelphia. So I got a chance to learn a little more about life in a city. Now, previously, I would see cars in front of me swerving in the road, and I'd be like, gee, why are all these cars swerving? <laughs> and then i see the pothole. Well, that's why they were swerving, because there's a three-foot pothole in the middle of the road. 
and now my tire is flat. City driving, right? But if we're following Jesus, maybe we can avoid some potholes on the road of life. You ever be driving and someone in the passenger seat keeps critiquing every decision you make? Or maybe someone in the back seat keeps shouting out directions? Now my car is in the shop right now. So last night when we went to pick up some food, I was driving my wife's car. Now it's been a while since I've driven her car and apparently my driving was not to her liking. So on the way back, she was just like, just, just, just give me the keys. Just give me the keys. I was like, yes, dear. <laughs> Take the keys. My brothers and sisters, God has given us the gift of life. And on the road of life, we have to let Jesus take the wheel. We can't be backseat drivers. God has given us the car, and the key to life is giving Jesus the keys. But isn't it so tempting to type in our own GPS coordinates, decide where we want to go, and then ask God for traveling mercies? Isn't it tempting to ask God to bless the plans we made without him? Isn't it tempting to treat God, the Father, like a fairy godfather, someone we call on when we need help getting to where we want to go? My brothers and sisters, if we follow our heart, we're putting our heart before Christ. If we pursue our passions, we're putting our passions before Christ. If we follow our dreams, we're putting our dreams before Christ. But if we follow Christ, Christ comes first. Everything else is a distant second. As the old saying goes, we can't put the cart before the horse. Though people try it, I don't know if this will work out for you, but we can't put the cart before the horse. Now, since Jesus is talking about following him even to death, it's unsurprising that many would rather not go that route. Many would rather protect and preserve their earthly life than lose it for Jesus. But in verse 35, he says, For whoever desires to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. Mark eight thirty-five. And again, the tense is continuous, meaning whoever continually desires to save their life will lose it. Now, there is some wordplay in this verse as multiple terms have multiple meanings. Basically, those who want to spare themselves the persecution and shame that comes with following Christ and therefore save their earthly life will actually lose out on eternal life. Those who literally or metaphorically lose their earthly life by following Christ will be saved and have eternal life. This is the so-called divine paradox. In order to have spiritual life with Christ, we must die to self, yielding our lives in loyalty to Jesus. We are to give up our self-centered plans and give ourselves fully to God's service spreading the gospel. We must give up the temporary pleasures of this earth for the everlasting treasures of eternity. In our human thinking, this divine logic sounds so backwards. But as Miss Clara said in the movie War Room, one of my favorite films, there is not room for you and God on the throne of your heart. It's either him or you. You have to step down. If you want victory, you have to surrender. The divine paradox. We must surrender to have victory. Continuing in Mark 8.36. It says, For what benefit is it for a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul or lose their life? Now this verse is often translated as lose their soul. But the Greek word often translated soul in verse 36 is actually the same word translated life in verse 35. You see, when people think of soul, they often think of a non-physical essence of a person apart from their physical body. But as has been said, this is not a biblical concept. The biblical emphasis in the word is on the wholeness and oneness of the person or self. So that being said, 
Jesus is referring to losing more than just one's physical life. So I think soul is an appropriate translation. I just wanted to mention that for the record. Just in case my Greek professor is watching. So even in English, we can see how the words soul and life can be used in similar ways. For example, a captain of a ship might say that there are 316 souls on board, meaning there are 316 people or 316 lives. Well, we don't want anyone to share a secret. You might say, don't tell a single soul, meaning don't tell a single living person. In any case, in our modern world, we often live know like dies with the most toys wins. But we know when life is over, we can't take anything with us. We can have worldly success, worldly fame, worldly riches. We can reach all of our personal goals, fulfill all of our personal dreams, and we can check off all the boxes on our personal bucket list. But in the end, what good is it if we lose our soul in the process? If we forfeit eternal life, it's no good. We gain nothing. Therefore, it is wise to be willing to lose our earthly lives for Christ and for the gospel. For gaining eternal life is more valuable than anything this world can offer. Continuing in Mark 8.37. For what can a person give in exchange for their life or their soul? What can a person give in exchange for their soul or their life? Once again, the obvious answer is nothing. Exchanging any amount of temporary wealth for one's eternal soul is a bad deal. The soul is the most valuable thing a person has. Nothing we have could ever pay for it. And if we lose our souls by refusing to follow Christ, nothing we gain in this world can compensate or buy it back. No matter how much money you have, you can't buy eternal life. It is priceless. And finally, Mark 8.30 8 our last verse of the night it says for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels mark 8:38 nowadays many biblical commands are considered old fashioned or worse many of us might prefer a bible with perforated edges so we can tear out those pages we don't like but in the words of Augustine, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, but yourself. I say that to say, regardless of what society says, followers of the Savior cannot be ashamed or embarrassed by Christ's words. Moreover, we cannot conceal our loyalty to him in order to avoid public shame. Earthly shame is a small price to pay for heavenly honor. Do we value the approval of people over the approval of God? As Paul says in Galatians 1.10, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I stopped being a people pleaser a long time ago. As I've said before, back in 2014, one night after I just finished DJing a gig, a preacher convicted me with the word. Long story short, he was like, how can you call yourself a Christian if you ain't living Christ-like? How can you call yourself a Christian, that is, a follower of Christ, if you ain't following Christ? Dear friends, if you call yourself a vegan, but don't abstain from eating meat, you're not a vegan. And if you call yourself a follower of Christ, but don't follow Christ, you're not a Christian. In any case, he convicted me with the word and showed me in scripture the error of my ways. And thanks be to God, the Lord began to work on me and change my career path. Christ began to change the whole trajectory of my life. After that, I started turning down DJing parties. I started meditating on the word more and I started wearing a wooden cross. But at the corporate events and weddings I still did, I would always tuck my cross in my shirt. Perhaps I didn't want to face possible shame for being a Christian. But more likely, I felt ashamed of what I was doing. 
and I didn't want to bring shame upon the Christ who endured the cross for me. My brothers and sisters, please learn from my mistakes. If we're engaging in any activity in which we would be ashamed to wear a cross, we likely shouldn't be doing it. So let's ask the Lord to make a way out, a way out of that ungodly relationship, a way out of that ungodly career, a way out of that ungodly lifestyle. And let's not be ashamed to deny ourselves and accept Christ. Let's not be ashamed to carry our cross for the one who was crucified. Let's not be ashamed to follow the one who was raised to life, that we may also be raised to life. We can't be afraid to be politically incorrect when we are biblically correct. In spite of the mockery of people who wither like grass, let's stand on the word of the Lord, which endures forever. Now, as it often does in the Old Testament, here adulterous refers to spiritual unfaithfulness, to spiritual disloyalty. Spiritual adultery. If we put anything before God, we are being unfaithful. And even in our human relationships, we know that people can say one thing and do another. With our mouths, we can vow to be faithful. We can tell God, I do. But it doesn't matter much unless we are continually faithful in our actions. I can't tell my wife, baby, I'm going to be faithful and then go and do my own thing on Saturday nights. And we can't do our own thing most days and only be faithful on Sunday mornings. If we say we're going to be faithful to Christ, we actually have to be faithful to Christ daily. Early in Mark, Jesus quotes Isaiah saying, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And being ashamed of Christ does not merely refer to one's inward emotions, but to one's outward actions. We can claim to know God and yet deny him by our actions. But we have to give God loyal service, not lip service. And here the word generation primarily refers to the people of Israel who were currently rejecting Christ. However, the word also refers to people who share common characteristics. Therefore, the same warning extends to any group of people who reject Christ and thus rebel against God. Furthermore, we've already seen that Jesus is not only the Messianic King and the Suffering Servant, but he's also the Divine Son of Man. At the Second Coming, the Son of Man will come with all authority to judge. As we see in Acts 17.31, Acts 17.31 Paul says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus will judge. Also, as we see in Matthew 25, 31 to 32, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 32. So on Judgment Day, the Son of Man will separate his faithful sheep from the unfaithful goats. Jesus came to save, and he will come again to judge. Those who deny him on earth he will deny in heaven. But those who do not deny him on earth, he will not deny in heaven. Justice will be served. So in conclusion, therefore we ought to serve the Lord. But before we say we want to follow Christ, we have to read the fine print. We rave about God's unconditional love, and rightfully so. But God desires unconditional discipleship. Discipleship is not some hobby that we do in our spare time. Christ wants us to give our whole lives to following him. We have to be more committed to Christ than to anything or anyone in this world. We may have perfect attendance in school, 
but how is our attendance to the Word of God? We may get straight A's, but what would our spiritual report card look like? We may get a promotion at work, but are we promoting the spread of the gospel? Do we spend more time in front of the small screens than the Savior's scriptures? Do we spend more money on things we don't need than on ministry the whole world needs? Do we spend more effort on our plans than on God's plan of salvation? Do we know the headlines of the bad news of the world better than we know the red lines of the good news of the word? The one who brought about our recreation can't take a back seat to sports and recreation. The king of the world can't play second fiddle to our worldly dreams. We should all ask ourselves, what is it that stands in the way of me following Christ wholeheartedly? Is there something or someone in my life that I'm putting before Jesus? We have to ask ourselves, is our personal passion more important than the passion of the Christ? There's only room for one on the throne of our heart, and no one can serve two masters. God doesn't want half-hearted devotion. He wants us to be lovingly devoted to him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. Therefore, we must deny ourselves, carry our cross daily, and follow Christ. In the words of Billy Graham, salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything we have. For many, such a cost is too high. Many would rather try to preserve their life, preserve their life and their self-determination. But ironically, seeking to save our earthly lives in this way leads to losing out on eternal life. On the other hand, literally or metaphorically losing our lives for the Christ and for the gospel leads to eternal preservation, eternal life. Worldly pleasures and possessions are so fleeting. Running after such temporary things is not worth losing one's eternal soul. If we are ashamed of Christ, Christ will be ashamed of us on the day of judgment. But if we follow Christ in suffering and self-denial, we will also follow Christ in being resurrected and glorified. In all this, Jesus sets the example. We just have to follow the leader. So let's do what the Deliverer does and obey what the Savior say. Now one of the worst lies this world tells us is this. You deserve it. You worked hard. You deserve to splurge. You worked hard. You deserve to spend your money on your own leisure and pleasure. You deserve to live life however you want. You deserve it. But in all actuality, we don't deserve anything. God deserves our everything. Because everything we have, our time, our talent, our treasure, is a gift from God. Every second of life we have is because of God's grace, God's unmerited favor. And we are to respond to God's grace with faithfulness. We have to give back what God has already given us. And it warms our Heavenly Father's heart to get gifts from his children. And he deserves it. The song goes, my hallelujah belongs to you. And it says all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, you deserve it. But we can also say all my time, all my talent, all my treasure, you deserve it. The Lord deserves it. We should use our God-given gifts, not for our glory, but for God's glory. If we can speak, we should be speaking for the Lord. If we can serve, we should be serving for the Lord. If we can sing, we should be singing for the Lord. If we can dance, we should be dancing for the Lord. If we can rap, we should be rapping for the Lord. And since I used to be a rapper, let me try to wrap this up. You see, it's wrong to think that this walk has no cost. Nowadays, everybody wants to be their own boss. But Christ tells us we got to bear our own cross. If we don't, I'm afraid it'll be our own loss. I used to do my own thing, man. I thought I was so smart. Giving lip service, but giving God no heart. I had selfish ambition like this might just work. But following Christ means Christ comes first. We'll go through trials. There'll be times to cry. But we got to stay firm, not just sliding by. We got to give it all. Got to be ride or die. And we'll understand it better by and by. 
We can't pay to be saved. We can't stack the odds. Got to be faithful, not just all talk. For there's only one way to get back to God. To cross that road, we got to take the cross walk. We got to take the cross walk. My brothers and sisters, we're at a crossroads. There are essentially two paths. The way of the lost and the way of the cross. Many times in our God-given life, like Peter, we may have in mind only human concerns, not the concerns of God. When that's the case, we have to get behind Jesus. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, we must follow him continually. If we're following Christ, Christ comes first. May the Lord bless you and keep you.